Well, good morning. Hey, you did it. Every week, I always get this half-hearted good morning, and it's like, come on, you can do better. So I am really impressed this morning that you gave that enthusiastic good morning, and it is a good morning. You know, I was just saying to somebody earlier, you know, this is the one kind of the week out of the year that you love living in Wisconsin because it's perfect weather. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's not snowing, it's not raining, it's not humid, it's perfect, you know, and so we have to be um, excited, we have to really enjoy it, we have to praise God for that as well, right? And so it's good to be here this morning and to experience uh, worship with you. Uh, Just a couple of announcements I want to highlight. Um, The first one is on the second paragraph in the bulletin. For those who have been interested in Marshview Ministries, what we believe, um, our history, why we're here, we got some informational meetings. Uh, Part of that is designed so it's just the basic information. It's an opportunity for you to ask questions as well as, you know, me giving some, I think, important information. But uh, it's usually, you know, people have all kinds of different questions when they're attending a church, and they're just not quite sure. And sometimes these informational classes are just a great place to be able to dialogue. And so um, if uh, you're interested in that, uh, we've, I'm going to set up two of them at two different times. On, on Wednesday mornings at August 25th is going to be the first one. Is at 9 o'clock. And then on the alternate Wednesday uh, we're going to do it in the evening, uh, September 1st at 6 p.m. And so these, like I said, are designed for information. But if you're interested in becoming a member, these are the things that uh, are really uh, great to be a part of. And I usually try to get a group together so that uh, we get the dialogue through it all together as well. Because sometimes somebody asks a question that nobody thought of before. And they go, hey, that's a really good question. So uh, those are happening. The other thing is, on the back information table, we've been in a process of discerning and, you know, beginning to discern what our future is for Marshview Ministries, uh, the ministries that God has for us and the opportunities that he placed before us. And uh, I said, I'm looking for volunteers to be a part of a discernment group. We've had some meetings that have been informational and, and, and trying to gather information about, you know, where we came from. Uh, what we have been doing, what's been positive, what things can we shore up or do better. We've accumulated all that uh, feedback from those, and so now we're in a process of of praying through and discerning. And so I'm looking for people to volunteer to be a part of a group where we can uh, work together to determine what has God got for us. And so on the back information table, I got about 30 of these sheets there for anybody that wants to grab one or if just read through But it says, what's the process that we're going through or what we want this group to participate in? And so there's just a sheet and a half back there. You can grab that. Uh, A lot of it is going to be dealing with reflection and prayer and Bible study and, and then looking at our community, looking at the needs of our church, and just trying to pray through what is God leading us or where is God leading us and what does he want us to do. So if you would like to be a part of that group for sure, grab one of these and uh, for just for everybody else if you're not interested in being a part of that group I just ask you to take one of those sheets see what we're doing there and pray along with us because really that is the I think the heart of ministry is prayer and that's where God is leading us and that's where God will lead us through so um, that's uh, that's it for those and then um, women's Bible study will meet uh, this Thursday morning at 9 a.m. So, if ladies, you can uh, participate in that. And uh, I think the rest you can just kind of read through and to see if there's information there that is pertinent for you and or your family. Um, you know, I just encourage you to read the bulletins. <laughs> Sometimes we grab them, we get the outlines, we never really pay attention to it, and you go, oh, that was in the bulletin? Yeah, it's in the bulletin. Those are there for a reason. So, uh, read through them. Uh, With that, why don't we begin our time together by standing together and our call to worship this morning from Psalm 5, verse 7. And uh, let's say this out loud together. 
Because of your unfailing love, I can enter your house. I will worship at your temple with deepest awe. Now, typically a call to worship, as we get often from the Psalms, is one that kind of invites us into worship. This one's a little bit different because it's kind of a statement, right? It, it's a statement. Because of your unfailing love, I can enter your house and I will worship. So it's not necessarily that call or that invite into worship, but it's a, it's a, it's a response to that call. And so this morning, as we said these words, I, I really hope and I really pray that it is your heart's desire to worship in his temple with his people with a sense of awe and wonder of who God is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the beauty of the day. We thank you for the beauty of being able to gather together as a group of people to worship you and to acknowledge you. We, we thank you for the beauty of who you are. May we reflect on that. May we stand back and just be in awe and wonder of, of the majesty, the holiness, the, the wonder of who you are, your beauty. And as we reflect on that, we stand back and just try to wrap our mind around it. I pray that it would inspire us, Lord, to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to raise your hands this morning. Receive a blessing from the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the wonderful, the powerful, and the mighty working of his Holy Spirit. Amen. I want you to take a couple of moments to, to turn around or walk around and say good morning and then we'll come into a time of worship. Let's come together to worship the Lord. And as our song, our psalm, just said, is that his love will never run dry. His love goes on and on. His love is unfailing. Well, let's come together and worship him with a whole heart. Your love goes on. 
honestly look at ourselves we are a broken people we act in ways that we don't even like about ourselves sometimes we say things that are discouraging and and often detrimental to others Uh, lord we just are broken and we can try our best we can do the best but yet we can realize that we fail so often And so we should be amazed by the love that you gave to us, that you came into this world in Jesus Christ. You died for us while we were still sinners so that we could experience grace. We could experience your love and a relationship with you. And so, Father, as we come to your word this morning, um, instruct us and teach us, encourage us, um, build us up in our faith so that we can live the lives that you desire for us and we can be a witness to the world around us of that amazing love. In Jesus' name, amen. You may have a seat and I'd like to invite the kids to come on up this morning and Sandy's got uh, a little message for you. So come on up, kiddos. Got a couple here. A little one. All right. (laughs) Thank you for coming up. I have a book here, it's College Math. And this book is real good for giving us the knowledge. We use math every day. I'm sure everybody will say at some point there's a little math mixed in with our day. So that's real good for knowledge. This book is the Bible. And Ephesians 5 at 15 it tells us so be careful how you live not as fools, but as those who are wise. That's wisdom. We have choices or discernment. It all works together. And I might say, hmm, now, what would you like? Cookies? Or an apple? <laughs> and most of us would. But we know that our parents and grandma might say, hmm, maybe you should take the apple, it's better for you. But there are things that we have to think about and make that decision. Now King Solomon had a dream. God came to him in that dream. And God said, what would you like? And King Solomon knew he had to lead his people and he had to do it well. He asked for wisdom. Smart man. He could have asked for a whole room full of candy or cookies, but he asked for wisdom. So God told him that because he made a wise choice, he was going to give him a little bit of everything. He honored the wealth and the wisdom, and that's good. So we want to make sure that we make the right choices from now until forever. We make the right choices. And that decision is all written down here in the truth, the truth of the word. 
and you can learn that any time that you have a decision to make, we can look in the Bible, and we can always pray about it. And when we pray, we ask God to give us that wisdom so we make the right decision. Why don't we fold our hands? Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. And thank you for the wisdom that you give us so that we may serve you better. Help us do right. We pray that we make the right decision because you're there for us and you help us. Thank you, Lord, for always being there. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sandy, you didn't give them the cookies either? Oh, that was terrible. <laughs> wow. I'm glad I'm not a kid. I would have been really disappointed. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Sandy and Marcelo, for being here. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the title of my message this morning. Being Mr. Rogers in a Jerry Springer neighborhood. Now, I'm usually not one for these quaint kind of titles or to catch people's attention or to show how witty I am because most of you know I'm not very witty anyway, so I usually fail when I try to do that. But I titled it this way to kind of demonstrate, and many of you kind of chuckled, to demonstrate the contrast between these two worlds, these two personalities. And um, I did this because I, I want us to think about the stark contrast that is present in that. And, um, and to think about, as we develop the message out a little bit, the stark contrast between Jesus as he comes into our world. And so I'm going to focus on that a little bit later. But let me just start off this morning with kind of giving us a quick snapshot of these two personalities. Because both of them are very well known in our culture today, but for very different reasons. Right? So the first one we're going to start off with is Mr. Rogers. We're familiar with him. Um, he was a Presbyterian pastor. He went into... Uh, production of television, and he did some other things than that, but he is well known for his Mr. Rogers neighborhood. It ran for 32 years on television. He had this calm, kind of instructive, soft-spoken, child-centered kind of a TV show that, that really was meant to help children kind of understand life, cope with difficult situations, to help them get in touch with their feelings and, and to be able to communicate. And so he had this demeanor that really kind of welcomed children in, and he would instruct them or kind of um, uh, nurture these kind of characteristics of, of kindness, uh, acceptance, forgiveness, love, and patience. And all of these virtues were kind of underlying all of his messages that he did over those 32 years. And, and so he had guests that come on, and he had his regular characters that came on, and I took one of the snapshots from this. It was Officer Clemens, and this was in 1969. Now, this was a significant scene. 1969 was just shortly after the end of the Jim Crow era. And so here is... Officer Clemens, and, and he's on his beat, and Mr. Rogers invites him to cool his dogs off a little bit, right? To take off his socks and shoes and get in the pool there and, and soak his feet. And it was really symbolic because, like I said, it was just 1969, just after all of the Jim Crow laws, and, and there was times of equal, right? This was the thing, equal but separate accommodations, and, and Mr. Rogers is really making a statement here, the end of segregation, and saying, you know what, we can be in the pool together. It's a remarkable thing in 1969. 
So let's contrast. Jerry Springer, the next one up. Jerry Springer show. Jerry Springer um, got his degree in political science. Um, he worked for uh, the Kennedy uh, campaign back in the day. He went to school to be a lawyer. He was even governor of, I think, New Jersey for one year. Now, I don't know how you become a governor for one year, but maybe they kicked him out. I don't know. But, um, but he was a, a, an actor, a radio host, and eventually he starred in the Jerry Springer show. The Jerry Springer show, if you are familiar with that, had a whole different tone than Mr. Rogers. What he would do is he would have topics on his show, and they would be controversial subjects of like infidelity, uh, incest, parent-child relationships, out-of-control teens, uh, people with money issues and, and uh, difficult situations. And, and so Jerry would bring them on as a guest, and he would talk with them and kind of get the scoop. And then he always had somebody in, in the shadows, right? that was in conflict with the person as his guest. So he would bring them on, and pretty soon there would be um, you know, arguing going on and name-calling, and pretty soon there would be sometimes fist fights, and it would just get out of control. They had to have security guards there to pull people apart, as this shows. And the crowd, the audience, was geared up for this. They love to feed into it. And so if, if Jerry wasn't getting it stirred up enough, they'd go, Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. They'd try to get the crowd going, right? And it was just total. Now, I got to admit, I did not watch Jerry Springer. I did see an episode, though, as I was sitting in a hospital waiting room while somebody from the congregation was having surgery. And so it was on the TV, and I was watching it. And I thought, Wow. Why would people do this? Why would people come in, put out their dirty laundry, have these conflicts right on national TV with the audience feeding them? Why would they do this other than their 10 minutes of fame, right? Now, controversy was sometimes this was all staged and other times it wasn't, but who knows? But this was the character and the nature of this show. Now, I'm going to get back to my title. What if, what if Mr. Rogers was the host of the Jerry Springer show? Wouldn't that, be, that would be so unimaginable, right? It's just, it just two different worlds. And I started thinking about this in line of what it was like for Christ to come into our world. Two vastly different scenarios, right? What was that like? And so I want to kind of focus that, and I'm going to allude back to the, the Jerry Springer illustration because, you know, no illustration is perfect, but I think having something tangible in front of us will help us to grasp the reality of what I'm trying to talk about this morning. All right, so let's go to the first point. If you have your outlines, you're free to grab those and follow along. The first one is this, Christ of the Incarnation. All right, now this is this word, incarnation. Typically, we hear this around the Christmas season, right? Christ incarnate, Christ coming. But I'm going to start off with this point this morning, and I'm going to bring us to a passage from John chapter 1, and I'm going to take sections of it from verse 1 to verse 9. But first, or verse 13, but I'm going to, Start off with the first five verses there. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him. And nothing was created except through him. The Word, speaking of Jesus, this is all about Jesus, the Word gave life to everything that was created. And his life brought light to everyone. And that light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Then verse 10, and he came into the world that he created. Right? That's that incarnation, Jesus coming into the world that he created. And so the word became human and made his home among us. Eugene Peterson says, calls this that Jesus moved into the neighborhood. Right? I want to bring us also to Philippians 2 
It has some similar context to it. It says, in your relationships with one another, the Apostle Paul writes, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. I, I, I like the way that uh, different translations put it, that it was something to be grasped or to held on to or to be clung to, right? Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Now, this Philippians passage, I want to highlight uh, two things here. The first part of that, it says, being the very nature God. Now, last couple of weeks prior to this, we did a series on the character and the nature and the attributes of God. And we looked at these attributes, and, and the whole thing was designed for us to be able to, to get a big, broad picture of the character, the nature, the attributes of God, and, and instill in us a, a, a deeper sense of worship for this God. But we looked at his goodness, and his holiness, and his purity, his sovereignty, his, his power, his his knowledge and his wisdom, the wisdom of God that Sandy was just talking about. And all of these attributes are very core, the nature of who God is, and all of these characteristics, all of these nature of who God is, all of these attributes of what we studied about the character, the nature, the attributes of God is embodied in Jesus Christ. It's embodied in Jesus Christ because he is God often referred to as the Son of God. And so what we see, and we see this, these attributes of God, Godhood, his divinity coming out in his ministry over the years. And let me give you some examples. Some of these you may be familiar with and others you may not be, but it says in the scripture that when Jesus taught, he had a level of authority that none of the other teachers had. Jesus was like, not just a step above, he was a flight of stairs above in his teaching authority. But that's because of Jesus' authority as God, right? It was deep and it was rich than just man's teachings. When Jesus was calling his disciples to him, there was a, a disciple named Nathaniel that was just approaching Jesus. And Jesus looks at Nathaniel and he says, I saw you sitting underneath a fig tree. You're a true Israelite, and in whom there is no guile or no falsehood. And this just kind of stunned Nathaniel. He goes, how do, how do you know this about me? Well, that's a revelation of God's knowledge in Jesus Christ, that attribute of knowledge. Um, he knew what people were thinking, Jesus did. Sign of his divinity. Um, when Jesus performed miracles, it showed that he was a Lord over the physical. When he calmed the seas, it shows that he was Lord over the nature. And, and what was the response of so many people when they were healed or whatever? They would bow down, they would worship him. Why, is, why did he accept that worship? Because he's God. People could worship him. When Peter catches a, a boatload of fish... Because Jesus tells him to throw the net on the other side, and Peter obeys, and he throws it, and he hauls in all of these fish. And Peter looks at Jesus, and he says, Lord, leave me because I am a sinful man. Why does he say that? Because in that moment, Peter sees the holiness of who Jesus is, and he's awed by it. It's his divinity coming through. On the, when, Jesus, when Jesus casts out evil spirits out of people, not just an evil spirit, but thousands of spirits, what is being demonstrated there? He's divine. He's God over the evil spirits even. 
See, all of these things are beginning to show. When Jesus goes on top of this mountain and Peter and James and John are with him and kind of heavens opens up and there's Elijah and there's Moses standing with Jesus and they're talking back and forth and, and Peter, James, and John on this mount, what we call it the Mount of Transfiguration, they're just overwhelmed. What's happening there? The divinity of Jesus is being demonstrated to these guys. It's unbelievable. So all of these episodes along the way that are recorded for us in Scripture, but the disciples had an opportunity to see it, is affirmation of Jesus' divinity. In John 1, verse 14, it says this, that he, Jesus, was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. We've seen his glory, his divinity. Now, the passage also then goes on, and it says that by, um, about Jesus in Philippians, it says the nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Now, I don't particularly like that part of that translation because it sounded like is that he just kind of looked like a human, right? Now, it's kind of interesting in our culture today, our society today, people struggle with this idea that Jesus is more than human. Right? So we think of Jesus as a good teacher, he's a moral leader, he's, he's a great guy, he's a good example. Just a little bit, a bit of information. If you're from a more liturgical church or if you've been in church for a long time and you've ever heard of the Apostles' Creed, the Apostles' Creed, right? We recite those things. What is the Apostles' Creed trying to affirm? His humanity. His humanity. Because back in the early church, they... they they didn't question his divinity, they questioned his humanity. So the Apostles' Creed talks about how he was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. All of these things prove his humanity. And so all of these things that we try to understand about Jesus, that he is 100% divine and 100% human, he's not just like a human, but he is made flesh. 100% human, 100% man. Now, we can't understand that. It's one of these mysteries of the gospel. There's one of these things that are, we can't quite get a handle on, we can't quite understand. But you know what? That's okay. That's all right. If you can't quite get this handle that Jesus was 100% human and 100% God and fully divine and fully human, you can't get that? All right. Because you know what? None of us can. And God doesn't expect us to understand it. He does expect us to believe it. Because this is outside of our capacity to understand fully. But the Bible affirms of his incarnation. That root word of incarnation, carnal, is from the Latin carno, meaning the flesh. Now, consider this. All right, so we understand this. So here, consider this a minute. Jesus is in heaven. He is in the presence. He is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's in perfection. It's in perfect unity. It's in the perfect holiness. His angels are surrounded. There's no sin. There's no evil. There's nothing in heaven that is detracting of the glory of, of being God. And in that state, God, as Jesus, chooses obedience and he steps into our world. Now think about that for a moment. He steps into our world. At Christmas time, we, we, you know, away in the manger, you know, we find that Jesus is born swaddling clothes, laying in a manger uh, to young parents and all of these things that, that we have this beautiful scenery around and it looks so quaint, but you know what? It's, it's dirty, it's noisy, it's messy. And then Jesus leaves heaven and he comes into this state and he lives there for 33 years in all of the messiness of our world. Mr. Rogers in a Jerry Springer neighborhood. Quite the contrast, right? So what was this move like? Well, imagine this for a second. You have Jerry Springer show. It's about to begin. The audience is all primed up. 
They're anticipating the conflicts, the language, the fights, the, all of the things that feed into that. And that's the audience. And in comes the first guest. They lay out all their, their dirty laundry out for everybody to hear what's going on. And they're ready for Jerry Springer to come in. But Mr. Rogers walks in. Now, how is the crowd going to respond to that? They're probably going to boo him and say, go back to your own show. We want Jerry. And they're going to go, Jerry, 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 because they want Jerry, right? But what Mr. Rogers does is he sits down and with his quiet, calm voice, he talks to the person and he tries to help them understand their situation and he coaches them and he introduces characteristics and behaviors that's respectful, honest, and caring. How is that audience going to react? They're not going to like that because they like the dysfunction. They love the dysfunction. That's why they're the audience. That's what they want to hear. And, and they want to see the conflict. They want to see the fighting. They want to hear the bad language and all of this stuff. And Mr. Rogers just doesn't fit their expectations, right? You know, actually, the first year Jerry Springer was on the air, he had a much different format. Uh, it was a little bit more, and this is dating myself again, a little bit more like Phil Donahue, a little bit more constructive and a little bit more civil. But they almost canceled his show after the first year because the audience rating was terrible. And so he switched to the current format of this conflict and this kind of excessive behaviors. And then the ratings went up. Because why? Because people love evil. People love to watch the dysfunction and the lives of people deteriorating in front of them. They like that. It's kind of a sick society, isn't it? So Mr. Rogers on Jerry Springer, it just wouldn't work. And that's the kind of the reception that Jesus received. Look at it, verse uh, 10 and 11. It says, but the world, in John chapter 1, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people and even they rejected him. You know, in other words, they booed Jesus out. They didn't want him. They actually did worse than booing him out. They yelled, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And he was crucified. Now this should shock us, but yet we're so familiar with the story, it really doesn't shock us, right? Because we're so familiar, but what I'm trying to do is to help us to be a little bit shocked at what our culture does. And why is it, why is it that, that, that in our scenario, Mr. Rogers would be booed off? Why is it that Jesus was yelled to be crucified? Why is it that that evil hates good? Why is it that when you stand up for good, so many times you're mocked and you're humiliated and you're brought down and you're just told that you're holier than thou? Why is it that evil hates good? Now, in this world, we don't experience perfect goodness and we don't experience perfect evil. We live in this world where there is these influences around us, both evil and good, and nobody is totally evil and nobody's totally good. Now, we may think we're totally good. We may look at somebody else and say, whoa, they're totally evil. But the reality is, in this world, these two characteristics, these two attitudes, these two kind of systems cooperate in this world together. Evil and good. In heaven, in the spiritual realm, there is distinct difference between good and evil. There is no overlapping. There is no evil found in God, and there is no good found in Satan. They are diametrically opposed to each other. And one does not overlap on the other. And so we don't see that in our world, but that's the way it is in heaven. We coexist, these influences. But because of the brokenness and the influence of evil in the world, we see that a lot of people reject good. And they embrace evil. It happens all the time. The scripture tells us in our second verse over here that the light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions 
were evil. Now, theologically speaking, you know, the, the, of course, good and evil are characteristics of the nature of God and the nature of Satan. Why did God allow, and the question is, why does God allow, why does God allow, or did God allow Jesus to be crucified by evil? See, Jesus' rejection, his goodness, and his rejection by evil was part of God's bigger plan for victory. I'm going to give you an illustration, and uh, it's a baseball illustration. And so if I totally mess this up, I am going to get evil looks from the Held family right here because they are all baseball, and I am not baseball. But I'm going to give you this illustration. And if I'm wrong, Corey, just stand up here and tell me the right, how it's right. So ever hear of a sacrifice fly? Sacrifice fly. What I get is that you've got to run around base. And so the batter, the next batter up, they want to advance the batter. So he hits the ball, a long, high fly out into the outfield. When the ball is caught, the batter is out. But the runner on base tags up, and he can run into home plate, and he scores the run. And so what happens there, is, that, is this a good summation of it? Good. Google helps tell you that. So what happens, right, is that the score is run. But what happens is that what looks like a loss for the batter, because he's out, really is a win for the runner, because he scores, and ultimately with the hope that the team wins. Right? It's a sacrifice fly. And that's what Jesus does in this cross situation. It looks like evil wins. Jesus dies. It looks like evil wins, but he doesn't win. Jesus sacrifices himself in order to secure the win for humanity. Jesus wins. He sacrificed himself. So let's make this personal a minute. Jesus moved into the neighborhoods. Our last point, Jesus moves into the neighborhood for the purpose, what, of your salvation. The incarnation of Jesus, he coming into this world, he moving into our neighborhood, showing up on our doorsteps gives us a means and a ways for salvation. Um, verse 12 and 13 of uh, John chapter 1, But to all who believe him and accept him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not of physical birth, resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. The ultimate reason why Jesus leaves heaven why Jesus takes on flesh, why Jesus moves into our neighborhood, why Jesus sacrifices himself is for the joy of our salvation. What seems to be a loss is a win. A win for us for eternity. So let's go back to the Jerry Springer illustration one more time. The show, as I said before, is planned and the guest is out there. Jerry, Jerry Springer's not there. Mr. Roger walks in. The audience is booing and jeering, and maybe they're throwing things at him. And, and, and Mr. Roger sits down next to the guest, and he looks him in the eye, and he starts talking to him, and he starts listening to their story. And, and, and he shows compassion, and he, and he shows what Mr. Rogers does so well, right? This understanding, and, and he nurtures them along. And, and what happens to this guest who was in there who was angry and, and bitter and had all these conflicts, they start breaking down, and they start crying. And, 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 and Mr. Rogers ministers to them amidst all this jeering and yelling and screaming for Mr. Rogers to leave because they want Jerry Springer. But what happens? There's healing that takes place. That's what it was for Jesus. Jesus comes into this world. The world did not accept him. They did not. They rejected him, even his own people. And there was noise, and there was jeering, and there was telling him to get out of here, and they didn't like him. What Jesus does is he sits down, and he looks us in the eye, and he talks with us. And he nurtures us, our spiritual life, and he welcomes us, and he brings healing into our life. And, and hopefully our response is that we kind of break down and we accept what Jesus has to offer. 
So that's the past. But you know what? Our society today is still jeering Jesus. They're still rejecting Jesus. It's hard in our society to be a follower of Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ's work is still going on. He's still sitting down, in a sense, visually, if you can look at this, he's still sitting down with people today, and he's looking them in the eye, and he's offering them healing, and he's welcoming them in, and he says, I have hope for you. Not what the world has. Because listen to them. They're yelling, and they're screaming, and they're fighting, and they want rejection. But I want life for you. And Jesus is still doing that today. So the question for us is, where do we sit? Are we in the audience? Are we the guest that Jesus is talking to and inviting us into that healing, that salvation? It's my hope that we're here and we're feeling that work of Christ in our life and that he's drawing us into that. And we find that hope. We find that salvation. We find that grace. We find Mr. Rogers in a Jerry Springer world. Over the next couple of weeks, what I want to do is I want us to to look at episodes in Jesus' ministry where he steps into Jerry Springer's world, right? Because Jesus had all these interactions with people of different backgrounds, different life situations, different problems, but his message was always the same. Packaged in different ways, but always the same. Come to me. And find what you're searching for. That's what Jesus still offers today. And you know what? Eventually what that does is for us as believers, we take on a role as well. Because Jesus isn't here anymore, right? But his spirit is. We're his disciples. We follow in his footsteps. We have an opportunity to be Mr. Rogers in some sense, in our Jerry Springer world. And that's what we're going to look at for the next couple of weeks as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for these words of Scripture that affirm to us the core of what we believe, that Christ Jesus did not think equality or or equality or or presence with God something to be held on to, to grasp, but humbled himself. He became a servant, a servant even unto death, by becoming human, stepping into our world, addressing our needs, understanding our problems, and offering us hope and grace and salvation. It's my hope and it's my prayer that as we look at these things about who Jesus is, that we understand that he came for us and that we can accept that, we can receive that grace. And Lord, help us to to see the world around us for what it is. And may we become ambassadors or people for you in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mary Linda, come up and lead us in worship. Stand together as we close. Be the way. 
be the center of our life. Um, Like the song says, be the wind in our sails, a fire in our heart. And and Lord, may these words this morning encourage us, challenge us, uh, but to help to to really wrap our mind around the reality of Christ coming into our world, stepping into our lives and being present for us. And so Lord, as we uh, uh, leave this place, May these words of, of Christ, may these words that were given to us um, move in our hearts that we might see the world around us in a different light and, and understand that, yeah, it is a messed up world and we live in messed up times and there's things that are so, what appears often to be evil. But, Lord, you are yet Lord of all things. And that is why you came into this world, because evil is present. And you give a way and a means for salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Enjoy some uh, fellowship time. And God bless. And.